Welcome to this video where we will be looking at the investigations and management of pulmonary emboli. If you've not already done so, be sure to check out our other video on the pathogenesis and signs and symptoms of pulmonary emboli. Firstly, let's start by looking at the investigations typically conducted when a pulmonary embolism is suspected. The evaluation of patients can be difficult due to the non-specific signs and symptoms that may or may not be present, especially in the pre-hospital environment where diagnostic testing is not available. That's why an important aspect of the diagnosis involves evaluation of risk factors and predisposing factors as covered in the triad of Virchow, which, if you remember from our previous video, includes patients with venous stasis, coagulopathy and endothelial injury. To assist in the evaluation of these difficult presentations, clinical decision tools are utilised such as the Wells score, which can help guide the sequence of diagnostic investigations based on a patient's risk of having a pulmonary embolism and providing us with a starting point to begin our investigations. The Wells score, or Wells criteria, is used to predict the probability that an individual is suffering from a pulmonary embolism, but it's not a diagnostic tool. It therefore helps guide clinical decisions about what further investigations are required. The Wells score consists of seven criteria, each of which is awarded a score based on the answer. The first question is whether there are any clinical signs and symptoms of a deep vein thrombosis, which we already know accounts for 90% of pulmonary emboli. A yes for this question scores a 3. The second question is whether a pulmonary embolism is the most likely diagnosis, but this should be after ruling out other disease processes, and a score of 3 is awarded for a yes. Is the heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute? As we know, this is a symptom of a pulmonary embolism. A yes scores a 1.5. But it's important to remember that some patients won't present with a tachycardia, especially if they're elderly and are on drugs such as beta blockers. The fourth question is, has the patient been immobilised for at least three days or have they had surgery in the past four weeks? These are both risk factors that come under Virchow's triad, and a yes scores a 1.5. Has the patient ever had a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism in the past? A yes scores a 1.5. Has the patient had any hemoptysis, which is the coughing up of blood? Again, this is another sign of a pulmonary embolism, as previously mentioned in our other video, and a yes scores 1. And does the patient have any malignancy, which is a risk factor for coagulopathy, and a yes scores 1. Adding up these scores, we can now assess the probability of a pulmonary embolism. A score greater than 6 indicates a high probability. A score between 2 and 6, there is a moderate probability, and a score below 2, there is a low probability. We can now use this score to help decide on what further investigations are required. If a patient scores 4 or more on the Wells criteria, then this is an indication for imaging, which can either be a CT pulmonary angiogram, which involves intravenous contrast that highlights the pulmonary arteries and any clots, or a ventilation perfusion scan, if the patient can not be given contrast for any reason, such as patients with renal failure. These scans help to show the perfusion within the lung tissue, and as we know, ventilation will be normal, but perfusion will be abnormal in those suffering from a pulmonary embolism. These patients will not require a D-dimer, as it is inferior to imaging and won't change the management. These scans will then identify whether the patient is suffering with a pulmonary embolism. 
If the patient scores less than a 4, then they require a D-dimer. It is important that when reviewing the D-dimer, you identify what unit of measurement the lab is using and what those specific ranges are. Typically, the cutoff point for D-dimer units is 250 nanograms per milliliter. And for fibrinogen equivalent units, the cutoff is 500 nanograms per milliliter. So anything above these values is a positive test. If the D-dimer is positive, so greater than the cutoff limit, then the patient requires imaging. In the same way that those who score a 4 or more do, so either with a CT pulmonary angiogram or a ventilation perfusion scan. If the D-dimer is negative, then it's unlikely the patient is suffering from a pulmonary embolism. Another investigation that can be conducted is a chest x-ray. And a chest x-ray may be performed to rule out other pathologies and may even appear normal in a patient suffering with a pulmonary embolism. However, you may see enlargement of the pulmonary arteries or wedge-shaped opacities. Another useful investigation, especially in the pre-hospital environment, is an ECG, which is usually normal in patients experiencing a pulmonary embolism so should not be used to rule in or rule out the diagnosis, but it does help to assess for other pathologies such as a myocardial infarction and for complications associated with a pulmonary embolism such as core pulmonale or right-sided heart strain. The changes on an ECG during a pulmonary emboli will be related to the strain being placed upon the right side of the heart, which can manifest in several ways. Looking at our normal ECG, we have a P, Q, R, S and T wave, and we would call this normal sinus rhythm. Firstly, we may see a sinus tachycardia, which is a heart rate typically over 100 beats per minute, and this is seen in 44% of patients suffering with an acute pulmonary embolism. But remember, it's important to take into account what the patient's baseline heart rate is, such as patients who are on beta blockers. An enlarged right atria may be present, which can be measured on the ECG by looking at the P wave. If the P wave measures 2.5 millimeters or higher, then this could be a sign of an enlarged right atria and is best seen in lead 2. This occurs in approximately 9% of patients suffering with an acute pulmonary embolism. A right ventricular strain pattern which presents with T wave inversion in V1 to V4 as these leads look directly at the right ventricle and there may or may not be T wave inversion in leads 2, 3 and AVF which look at the inferior aspect of the heart. A right ventricular strain pattern is seen in approximately 34% of patients suffering with an acute PE and represents the difficulty that the right ventricle is having trying to overcome the pulmonary artery pressures. Another investigation that can be conducted is an arterial blood gas. Patients suffering from an acute pulmonary embolism often have a respiratory alkalosis because of the high respiratory rate which removes excess amounts of CO2 from the body. However, as the patient deteriorates and can no longer compensate, this may reverse, and an arterial blood gas may show low oxygen levels, high carbon dioxide levels, and the pH may decrease, showing a respiratory acidosis. There may also be a raised lactate as cells go into anaerobic metabolism. Cardiac biomarkers are taken to assess the severity of strain being placed upon the heart and will help guide management. In patients with right-sided heart strain, there may be raised troponin, which are proteins released during times of injury. There may also be a raised brain natriuretic peptide, 
otherwise denoted as BNP, which is released by the heart when the ventricles are stretched beyond normal capacity. Brain natriuretic peptide gets its name because it was first discovered in the brain. Natriuretic means to cause natriuresis, which is the excretion of sodium in the urine, thus reducing total circulating volume and easing pressure on the heart. Now we have a good understanding of the investigations that can be conducted, let's move on to look at the management. Pre-hospital management is going to focus on correcting any life-changing abnormalities, ensuring hemodynamic stability and preventing patient deterioration. Good history and physical examination are essential to rule out other pathologies and identify the likelihood of a pulmonary embolism being present. It is very difficult to identify a pulmonary embolism in the pre-hospital environment and the presentation is similar to other pathologies. Oxygen should be provided to help maintain saturations above 94% or for those with COPD, what is normal for them. If pulmonary edema is present, then nitrates and diuretics may be given. In the pre-hospital setting, you are not going to know what the underlying cause of the pulmonary edema is because when pulmonary edema is present, it will mimic that of heart failure. Fluids may be given carefully if the patient is hypotensive to ensure adequate perfusion. Analgesia as required as these patients may be in some pain. And priority should be focused on rapid transport to hospital and careful monitoring. Treatment in hospital will vary depending on the patient's condition. It is important to check local procedures and guidelines. To help guide management, we can separate these patients into four categories. Asymptomatic pulmonary emboli are those that are found during investigations for other pathologies that are unrelated to the patient's presenting condition. For example, a pulmonary embolism detected on an abdomen CT scan. These patients will present with no signs or symptoms and have no signs of cardiac strain and will have normal vital signs. These patients are safe to be managed in the community with a subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin such as anoxaparin, followed by an anticoagulant such as warfarin or a NOAC such as apixaban or rivaroxaban. Symptomatic pulmonary emboli are those patients who have symptoms such as chest pain or shortness of breath, but do not have signs of cardiac strain and will not be hypotensive. These patients will need to be managed in hospital to prevent the patient from worsening and is normally treated with a low molecular weight heparin or heparin infusion, followed by an anticoagulant. The next category is a submassive pulmonary embolism. Patients with a submassive pulmonary embolism will present with symptoms and evidence of heart strain, such as raised troponins or raised brain natriuretic peptides, as we've already discussed. These patients may also have a right ventricular strain pattern on their ECG but they will not be hypotensive. These patients may need to be managed in a high dependency ward and will be treated with heparin and an anticoagulant. The final category is a massive pulmonary embolism. Patients suffering with a massive PE will need management in an intensive care unit. These patients are symptomatic, have signs of cardiac strain and are hemodynamically compromised. These patients are treated with a thrombolytic agent such as a tissue plasminogen activator to destroy the clot, which may include streptokinase or tenecteplase, and these patients may need thrombectomy, which is the removal of a clot. Anticoagulation is normally continued for three months if there is a reversible cause of the pulmonary embolism. If the cause is unclear, 
or there is an irreversible underlying cause or the patient has cancer, then anticoagulation is normally continued for six months. To recap, the evaluation of patients can be difficult due to the non-specific signs and symptoms that may or may not be present, especially in the pre-hospital environment where diagnostic testing is not available. That's why an important aspect of the diagnosis involves evaluation of risk factors and predisposing factors. To help assess the likelihood a patient has of suffering a pulmonary embolism, the well score can be utilised. This is also used to help guide management and will result in either a CT pulmonary angiogram or D-dimer. Other investigations may include a chest x-ray, an ECG or an arterial blood gas. Pre-hospital management should be focused on assessment and hemodynamic stability. Patients can be suffering an asymptomatic, symptomatic, submassive or massive pulmonary embolism based on their presentation. And it's important to remember that this is based on their presentation and not the size of the clot. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other videos and if there are any topics you would like us to cover, then please leave a comment in the comment section below.